They are being called Latin America's lost generation. Teens and young adults who drop out of school and rarely find work. Who are the Ninis? I'm Elaine Reyes in Washington, D.C., and this is America's Now. First up, a shocking study shows the high number of Latin American youth with no education or employment. A demographic between the ages of 15 and 24 are nicknamed the Ninis. These youth that don't have an opportunity in the labor market suddenly don't have options. So it's really the perfect setting for these young youth to fuel the, the problem of criminality and, and insecurity in the country. Correspondent Mike Kirsch travels to Mexico where this trend is prevalent. He'll tell us how the Nini lifestyle can lead to crime and violence. Then with the 2016 Olympics in Brazil just weeks away, we profile some participants in the games. This week our portrait is of a female athlete who's a rhythmic gymnast. Her sport combines gymnastics with dance. For this week's Olympian segment, witness the grace and style of Natalia Gaudio. And later, marijuana has been legalized in Colombia for medicinal and scientific use. But is Colombia ready? This is cannabis and coca leaves. Correspondent Michelle Bege reports from Bogota on the country's reaction to the new decree. Welcome to the show. The World Bank has released a disturbing report. 20 million young people in Latin America are neither in school nor working. They're mainly impoverished youth referred to as ninis, a Spanish word derived from the Spanish phrase, ni estudia ni trabaja, and they're draining economies and fueling widespread crime. Mexico has been particularly hard hit with the problem of ninis. There's been a significant correlation between the rise in the number of ninis and the rise of homicide rates in Mexico over the last decade. Correspondent Mike Kirsch reports. Jose's carried a gun since he was 15. Machín, limpiecito. Sí. Brothers here in Mexico. <laughs> There's seldom a time when they're not armed. And seldom a time when they are not growing a lot of marijuana. And smuggling tons of it to gringos in the U.S. each year. <laughs> they say they do it to support their families. None of them go to school. And they say there are very few legal jobs around here in this impoverished region of Mexico, the northwest Pacific Coast state of Sinaloa. <laughs> Protecting their turf, they say people who interfere with somebody else's livelihood in these parts are often severely dealt with. But now there's some new information coming out about the estimated 100,000 murders in Mexico over the last decade, indicating they can no longer simply be labeled drug-related murders or murders among drug traffickers. There's more to it than that, according to a new study released by the World Bank that reveals a core issue behind all of this killing. The rise in the number of murders in Mexico correlates directly with the rise in the number of young people with no education or jobs. Without schooling or employment, they often turn to crime. Guys like 18-year-old Hector here, who claims he's already been in several gunfights and that as a hired hitman or sicario tells me he's killed at least four people that were on a list of enemigos. And he says there are plenty more enemies out there gunning for him. So he carries his piece with him wherever he goes. The gun is the law here. 
es necesaria. Protección de mi vida. Y este, este venga de los Estados Unidos aquí. Es México, es estadounidense. Okay. Hecha en Estados Unidos. No. ¿Cómo está la vida aquí? Pues difícil, dura, mae. Machín. Necesitamos trabajar. Y el gobierno nos deja cambiar. Y no nos quiere ayudar. Pues andamos valiendo madre. Vector is among an estimated 20 million young people across Latin America and the Caribbean who are the subject of the World Bank's recent report out of school and out of work. One of its authors, Miguel Sizkelly, tells CCTV the report is one of the most comprehensive studies ever done on young people referred to as ninis. That youth between ages 15 to 24 are neither at work or nor studying the ninis, ni estudian, ni trabajan, don't work, uh, or don't study. Zakeli says one in five youth is living as a nini. Two-thirds of ninis are often young women, as young as 15, many who become mothers and drop out of school and or feel bound to cultural pressures that still exist for them to stay home to raise their families rather than work outside the home. As for male ninis, they range from city-raised boys opting often for video games and shunning school to rebellious would-be college kids who party too much to young college graduates in cities like Mexico City who can't find decent paying jobs once they leave school to a majority of males from impoverished rural Mexico who drop out of schools young to help support their families often resorting to joining criminal gangs that guarantee them better pay researchers say the public at large often believes the term nini is an individual or individuals who are lazy or don't make an effort to better themselves. But that's not always the case. It sort of puts the blame of the issue on the youth themselves. It's like if they were just there and they don't feel like going to school, don't feel like working, and that's not really the case. And actually this study, I think, very eloquently shows that. Zakili says, the study shows that while the economy has been growing in Mexico, it's not led to more jobs for youths because much of the economic growth has come from, for example, oil exports, an industry that creates huge profits for an elite few in the private sector and in government circles. Looks good on paper, but features little trickle-down benefits in terms of jobs for Mexico's youth. These youth that don't have an opportunity in the labor market suddenly don't have options so it's really the perfect setting for these young youth to fuel the the problem of criminality and, and security in the country a perfect storm for increased criminal activity he says <laughs> when you add America's demand for illegal narcotics to the equation in Mexico these are very highly rewarded activities. You see these guys with a, a incredible uh, arms. For example, 16-year-old Chewy here has been running and gunning and dodging Mexican government forces for years as a young marijuana trafficker. When I ask him if there's something else he'd rather be doing than working the marijuana trade with his family, he tells me he's always dreamed about building buildings in the city. Architecto. Architecto. Ah, you want to be, you want to be an architect. Edificios. But the nearest college for that is a hundred. Family tells him they can't afford to lose his help in the weed trade. It's an often vicious trade that produces young men like Pablo, whose father not long ago is said to have been murdered by a rival drug gang. Pablo vowing revenge. The internet is awash with images and reports about ninis, not just in Mexico, but across Latin America. On average, Latin America is said to have as many ninis as the rest of the world. 
one in five kids being ninis, which is actually far better than the Middle East and North Africa, for example, where one in three kids are ninis. Though the number of Latin American ninis is nearly double the rate of industrialized nations such as the U.S. and in Europe. However, the numbers of ninis in Latin America also vary by country. For example, in Peru, there are actually fewer ninis than in the United States. The highest numbers of ninis in Latin America are found in Brazil, Colombia, and Mexico, mainly because of the larger populations of these countries. There is less violence among ninis in countries like Peru and Argentina, Uruguay, Chile, and Paraguay because of stronger economies and better living conditions compared to, say, Central American countries such as Honduras, Guatemala, Panama, and El Salvador. In Central America, more than one in four, or 25 percent, of adolescents are ninis. And communities with the least educated kids are generally the more violent communities in the country. It's also been said that another contributor to the rise in ninis across some countries in Latin America are remittances sent here from their families around the world that have created what's called a legacy generation of kids who don't feel the pressure to study hard or to even look for a job. Young people, some might call spoiled, drifting further away from their parents' and family's control. As for what's being done about the problem of ninis, we turn back to Mexico. The Mexican government is routinely criticized for not investing more funds on education and job training for its youth, particularly when it had surplus funds to do so during better economic times at the start of the 21st century. The problem is that with more resources, that would have been the best opportunity to actually address the structural the causes of, of poverty and, and inequality and nini, problems like the ninis derived from them. Researchers say fixing the problem with ninis will take more ambitious efforts to educate Mexico's poor, which make up roughly half of Mexico's population. Researchers say if this can be achieved across Latin America, ninis could transition into a juggernaut labor force one day. If you give this relatively younger population much better education, it's a, a potential wealth of human capital that could fuel economic progress. Progress, unfortunately, blocked, says Zekele, by generations of political corruption. Because uh, the political systems in Latin America are still economic systems that are ruled by elites. Accountability is very low still. I mean, it's increasing, but most Latin American countries come from either a, story, a history of dictatorships, authoritarian, uh, authoritarian governments. Mexico was not a dictatorship of one person, but of a, you could say, of a, of a party. And uh, the consequences of that is that people are learning about democracy, democracy now. No, you just heard about what happened in Bolivia. I mean, uh, the president was going for a fourth uh, term in office. I mean, we're still... Uh, Latin America has not evolved in its mind to really having a full functioning democracy. Ultimately, it's rampant corruption in countries like Mexico that appears to be inhibiting any relief for ninis anytime soon. Where does this stop? I mean, if there was, if there was rule of law and no corruption zero in Mexico, the magnitude of this could have never scaled up in the way it has. Experts say if something isn't done to address ninis soon, the number of ninis in Mexico and across Latin America will continue to rise in alarming numbers. Further straining economies, further threatening security and stability. And more youths like many here in Mexico will choose to live life by the gun. Correspondent Mike Kirsch, thanks for that report. The government of Mexico spends over 5% of its gross domestic product on education programs each year. However, much of that money goes to paying teachers' salaries. Coming up. An Olympian whose sport incorporates dance into gymnastics. We call the elements we do with our hand, the masters. America's Next. Welcome back. For our Olympian segment this week on America's Now, we profile a female athlete from Brazil. 
She is one of the world's top ranking rhythmic gymnasts. Her sport looks very graceful, but don't be fooled by the spectacle. It requires tremendous agility and strength. Rhythmic gymnastics combines gymnastics with dance and handheld props like hoops and ribbons. For Olympians, we introduce you to the impressive Natalia Gaudio. Natalia Gaudio and I'm gonna be in Rio in 2016. O arco é um dos que eu mais gosto. Eu tenho mais sensibilidade porque eu acho que ele é um aparelho que te dá diversas oportunidades e formas diferentes de executar manejos. Que a gente chama os elementos que a gente faz com as mãos, as maestrias. A bola é um aparelho lindo, precisa estar sempre em contato com o seu corpo, fazendo rolamentos e ondas. Como se a bola tivesse colada no seu corpo, fizesse parte do seu corpo. Mas a bola é um aparelho bem traiçoeiro, assim. Qualquer errinho que você tiver, é, a, a bola pode sair rolando para fora da quadra e é um grande problema isso. É um aparelho muito bonito também e um dos mais difíceis. Porque ele não é um aparelho só na sua mão, são dois. Você precisa estar o tempo inteiro movimentando. Se você deixar o aparelho parado na sua mão, você vai estar perdendo ponto. Eu acho que é o aparelho mais bonito, né? Para o público, mais bonito de se ver na televisão. E todo mundo adora a fita. Você precisa estar movimentando ele também sem parar na sua série. Ele não pode ficar parado no chão, senão você vai estar perdendo ponto. Não é fácil de lidar com a fita, porque a fita pode dar um nó e acabar com a sua série. Eu adoro fazer fita. A minha série desse ano, inclusive, é muito alegre, animada, porque é um samba. Então, adoro estar fazendo a minha série desse ano de fita. Mas a minha professora sempre viu um algo a mais em mim. Ela passou a 
passou a se comunicar com a Mônica, que é a minha atual técnica. E a partir de então, com nove anos, eu já estava treinando na seleção capixaba. Foi uma experiência que não só mudou a minha vida de ginasta, mas mudou a minha vida pessoal também. Eu pude ver como as meninas que realmente tinham a ginástica e ritmo como um esporte profissional na vida delas, como era a rotina delas, como era o treino delas. E eu voltei pra cá já assim me sentindo outra pessoa. Subir no pódio, assim, pra mim, em primeiro lugar, tinha um gosto indescritível. Eu queria aquilo de novo. Eu queria experimentar ser campeã novamente. A gente estava voltando de uma festa e no dia estava chovendo bastante. Eu não me lembro muito bem porque foi tudo muito rápido, mas a gente é, foi fazer uma curva que é bem perigosa. O carro acabou escorregando na pista, com certeza por conta da água também. A gente nunca esquece o que aconteceu. A gente tira a dor do foco, sabe? A gente consegue, assim, é... a gente consegue driblar um pouco essa dor, esse sofrimento, a saudade, que vai estar sempre ali no nosso coração. Mas o que fica hoje são os momentos bons que eu passei junto com a minha melhor amiga, Duda, que estava ali todo dia comigo treinando e sempre torceu muito pela minha carreira. Você viver uma situação dessa é uma coisa que transforma você de, um, de uma forma tão grande que você tem que ver o lado positivo, porque senão você não acorda. Para mim, a experiência que eu posso passar para ela é todo dia olhar no olho dela e falar assim, não, Duda está aqui entre nós. E você tem que ser feliz, porque a Duda é feliz, ela está feliz onde ela está. O que parecia para lá para fora, algo tão ruim para nós se tornou algo muito grande que indescritível. Virou realmente uma ponte, uma ponte para você chegar onde você puder. A gente vai estar ali com certeza dedicando esse momento que vai ser muito especial a Duda. Quando eu entro na quadra para competir, é como se eu estivesse entrando junto com ela. É, é a força dela, a força da Mônica. E tudo junto, assim, em uma alma. Eu acho que a parte mais importante de eu estar representando a ginástica rítmica, o Brasil nas Olimpíadas, dentro da minha casa, é o legado que eu vou deixar para as próximas gerações. O que eu mais quero para as Olimpíadas é poder fazer bonito.
mostrar o meu trabalho, sair satisfeita com, a minha, com as minhas apresentações. Para que eu possa deixar realmente o Brasil orgulhoso desse nosso esporte. The 2016 Summer Olympic Games take place from August 5th through the 21st. Coming up. A new law decriminalizes marijuana for medical use in Colombia. No, yo. O sea, yo noto que me baja el dolor. I noticed that I don't have as much pain anymore, but it doesn't relieve it completely. What I truly believe now is that it's an organic alternative to chemo for me. America's Now. Welcome back to America's Now. Last year, Colombian President Juan Manuel Santos signed a law that legalized the growth and sale of medicinal marijuana. He joins Latin American countries like Uruguay who hope to take the illegal drug out of the hands of drug traffickers and circulate it responsibly. Santos also said it's a good example of using natural resources to fight disease. Smoking marijuana or cannabis is not the only way to consume the drug. Products containing cannabis now include creams, oils, sprays and shampoos. Correspondent Michelle Begay has more on Colombia's legalization of marijuana and how the medical community and Colombian citizens are responding. Valeria Rincón was born in January of 2012. After six months, her mother, Paola Zuluaga, started to see a slowdown in her development. Diagnosed with refractory epilepsy, the doctors couldn't get the seizures under control, so they increased her medication. The problem is the neuropediatras. Como están cerrados al tema, es que ellos piensan que se le puede seguir subiendo la dosis, no importa que la niña quede dopada, lo importante es que no convulsione. El problema es que igual siguen convulsionando, pero los niños quedan completamente dopados. Baby Lele, as her mother calls her, was taking four anti-seizure medications and had up to three seizures a day. Zuluaga says the drugs had her baby in a constant, drunk-like state. A pediatrician suggested an alternative method. Le dimos la primera gotica y Vale pasó de convulsionar los primeros, o sea, de todos los días a los primeros tres días. Duró tres días sin convulsionar. Ahí íbamos subiendo las dosis y Vale empezaba a convulsionar por ahí cada dos meses y medio, que eso ya era una avanzación. Eran súper corticas, a Vale antes le daban, le duraban 17 minutos, pues la gorda no reaccionaba ni nada, se mordía la lengua, le salía sangre. Y en las últimas convulsiones Vale se reía. Yo le decía como, Vale, quédate aquí, te apoyo que estás convulsionando. Y se reía y alzaba los brazos para que la cogiéramos. Suluaga claims her daughter has not had a seizure in eight months, thanks to medicinal marijuana. Valeria takes just one drop of cannabis oil three times a day and complements it with one other anti-seizure medication. Valeria's mom tried the oil to see if it produced any drugging effects. It hasn't even showed up on drug tests. Valeria is just one of the patients that could benefit from a Colombian law that would make medicinal marijuana legal in Colombia. Sí, señor. Today, patients like Valeria purchase pure cannabis oil from small producers like Finca Interactiva. You could call it a somewhat underground industry, as Finca Interactiva doesn't even post a sign outside their operations. Jenny Jimenez, co-founder of the group, says they are completely legal, operating under a 1986 Colombian law. This law on narcotics says 20 plants or more are considered an illegal plantation. The loophole allows producers in Colombia with a maximum of 19 plants to sell medicinal products without regulation. Nosotros nos tomamos o nos autorregulamos, mejor dicho, con este tipo de con esta ley 
Sí, eh, eh, empezando a sembrar ya 20 plantas. Sí, y todo lo justificamos con un formulario de pacientes donde el paciente nos, nos llenaba, o el usuario medicinal, más bien, nos, llen, nos llenaba el formulario donde decía para qué uso le requería el, el derivado. Sí, nunca se vendió flores, solamente se vendía el derivado. On December 22, 2015, President Juan Manuel Santos tried to close the loophole by issuing a decree that legalized the production and sale of medical marijuana. Acabamos de dar un paso importante para ubicar a Colombia a la vanguardia en la lucha contra las enfermedades y lo hacemos a través de un decreto que busca aprovechar las bondades del cannabis, de la marihuana para mejorar la vida de las personas. The decree says the Ministry of Health and National Council on Narcotic Drugs will regulate the possession of plants, production, distribution and export for medical and scientific purposes. El decreto lo vemos con muy buenos ojos, igual eh, nos sirve mucho y también le sirve mucho al usuario medicinal porque también empezaban a salir empresas que eran muy fraudulentas, que no, que no ofrecían digamos, una calidad en el proceso del, de, de sus derivados ni nada para, para estas personas. ¿sí? And quality organic medicine is what producers like Finca Interac Viva say they have been making for the last year and a half. They have oils, lotions, and ointments ready to be delivered to Colombian homes, products that cost around 7 to 10 U.S. dollars. Bueno, estamos en, esto es un taller de extracción de resina. Es un taller de extracción de resina. Es decir, extraemos el aceite que se encuentra dentro de la flor de la cannabis. Este es un taller de extracción. Acá tenemos algunas flores de cannabis ya secas, previamente secas. Hay algunas pocas. Este es Black Russian. Como puedes ver, es una... Es una, eh, es una planta que es activa con índica. Nosotros trabajamos con algunas clases de híbridos, las cuales son las que nos sirven para producir la medicina que, que requerimos. Mario Francisco Sánchez es Jenny's partner at Finca Interac Viva. He is in charge of creating the oils in their small kitchen lab. According to Sánchez, the decree will help business standards. Nosotros a lo que recurrimos es estandarizar procesos con algunas clases de plantas y ahorita con el decreto esos procesos estandarizados van a pasar a un laboratorio certificado donde digan qué cantidad de THC y CBD tienen. O si no estaríamos jugando a colocar unas tiritas que no nos van a dar ninguna constancia exacta de lo que puede ser el producto. Tetrahydrocannabinol o THC y cannabidiol o CBD son los dos principales ingredientes en la marihuana plant. They are used in most of the prescription drugs that come from marijuana. Just three months after the decree was signed, Colombia approved the sale of Sativix, a spray used to treat muscle spasms caused by multiple sclerosis. The formula includes THC and CBD. We reached out to Colombian pharmaceutical chemist Nestor Alves. He has been working at an organization called High Cost Patients that protects the rights of Colombians who suffer from the high cost of health care. His concern? That the cost of drugs like Sativix has proven to be a barrier in other countries. In New Zealand, Sativix can cost a reported 16,000 US dollars for a yearly prescription. Para nosotros como colombianos, como representante de pacientes, eh, consideramos que el país estaba atrasado en esta resolución ya que en otros países ya existe y lo peor que nos podía pasar a los colombianos es que siendo productores hubiéramos tenido que importar de otros países eh, cannabis para uso medicinal. Álvarez is in favor of leniency and more research on the positive effects of smoked cannabis in patients. Creo que de pronto puede haber algo sobre los mitos sociales, sobre la adicción o algo que no dejan que esta ruta sea explorada más como una forma de consumo de medicinal más, mucho más fácil y mucho más rápida también para los usuarios. Siento un poquito como de, digamos, pereza. A way out of pain is why someone suggested marijuana to cancer patient Judith Salas Castellanos. La marihuana, bueno, pero pues yo decía, no, yo aquí con chinos, con jóvenes, porque mis hijos son jóvenes, o sea, con jóvenes y tener marihuana en la casa, eso es darles una tentación. In her 58 years of age, she had never tried the drug, 
and felt it was too late to do so now. But she started to do her own research on how cannabis could help the pain experienced during stage 4 liver cancer. So she started drinking it in the form of tea. Judith is referring to studies by researchers at Harvard University that found marijuana cuts tumor growth in common lung cancer and reduces the ability of the cancer to spread. The tests have been conducted on mice. Judith claims she has seen reductions in her tumors when comparing scans from the last six months. Sí, y pues yo le estoy dando más cannabis al cuerpo, porque como es oral, el primero que paga es el hígado. Sí, entonces voy a reforzarla en en las tomas. Voy a colocarle una dosis más diaria y le hago control en el próximo pedestal. Whether or not there is enough evidence to conclude that marijuana can be the next cancer drug has yet to be seen. But what is clear is that people's negative view of the drug is changing. Weeks before the decree was passed, a poll showed 70% of Colombians approved of the medicinal and scientific use of cannabis. But Jaime Villaveses, an addiction specialist who treats people with substance abuse, says this openness becomes a double-edged sword with Colombia's youth. O en los Estados Unidos la están cultivando y se puede usar y también de manera recreativa. De hecho, aquí hay un senador, el Senado colombiano, cierto, está buscando la legalización de la marihuana para lo medicinal. Entonces, si todo eso está ocurriendo, ¿cómo me vas a decir tú que es que eso es algo que no se puede hacer? Claro, los chicos van a tomar lo que ellos les conviene escuchar para poder normalizar algo que saben o que no les están permitiendo hacer. He reminds us that marijuana is a psychoactive drug that alters a person's state of consciousness, just like alcohol. While advocates point to a 9% rate of addiction, Villaveses says this number can more than double when used before the age of 18. But can you get addicted from medicinal use? Villaveses says you can become dependent without even realizing it. La marihuana en términos de eso es perversa porque genera poca tolerancia. El tetrahidrocannabinol se fija en los tejidos grasos del cuerpo, se elimina lentamente. De hecho, en las pruebas biológicas de rastreo, aparece hasta 15 o 20 días después de haberse hecho el consumo. While a decree was signed by the president this December, Colombian lawmakers are trying to pass a law to make medicinal marijuana a legal fixture for years to come. In April, Mexico's President Enrique Peña Nieto proposed legalizing medicinal marijuana and also wants to decriminalize possession of the drug in small amounts. It's a complete turnaround for the leader as he once strongly opposed the move. Coming up. An interview with Colombian pop sensation Fonseca. I just write the music that I feel that I have to write, you know, it's like uh, in a big picture I can tell you that uh, I'm going to keep on exploring with uh, Latin rhythms and, and fusions, you know, and that's what I like to do. America's Nest. Welcome back to America's Now. Fonseca is a three-time Latin Grammy winner and a philanthropist. The singer has been involved in the reintegration of former guerrilla members into Colombian society and supporting the UN campaign ending violence against women. It has earned him worldwide admiration and respect. We recently had a chance to talk to him about the social, political and educational issues of his home nation, Colombia, during his U.S. tour promoting his latest album. <laughs> Pocas cosas me dan miedo y una de ellas 
haces perder la luz de tu mirada. Vine a buscarte porque yo sueño contigo y no pienso echarte al olvido esta vez. So, talk to me about your latest album, Conexión. What, Conexión. What, what was the inspiration behind that? Um, the first inspiration, like, talking about the music, it was exploring different things. It's the first time I record salsa, I did it with Victor Manuel, that is a great singer, and, and for me, uh, I've always loved salsa, so, so doing it with him was amazing, and, and all the songs were very different. I, I explored different rhythms that, that I didn't explore before, so, so that was like the first inspiration. Lyrically talking, uh, there's a lot of things. My son Manolo, as uh, you just saw, uh, the, the, actually a song called Colección. It was a song that, uh, that I wrote him. He was born like two months before uh, I was recording, so he was one of the big inspirations during the, during the production, during the recording. And there's a, also a song that talks about Colombia and the, and the peace process and everything. So, so yeah, this, it's like my life in in 12 songs. <laughs> really truly an ambassador for Colombia um, you are out there promoting what the country has to offer it's become a place where so many people now want to come visit uh, the beaches the mountains what have you noticed what has changed in your country most over the last several years well there's a lot of things that have changed it's uh, we, we we went through a, a very difficult period like, I don't know, 15 years ago. It was the violence and everything, and, and, and all that, that has changed, you know, like the, now you can, you can travel all around the country. Uh, there are beautiful places, as you say, mountains, uh, the beaches, everything. And, but I think that most of all, the mentality. It's like uh, we feel, well, we've always felt uh, um, very proud of our country, but right now everybody's like really, really into a different mood, and it's it's another country. You talk about it so much. Uh, you also performed in the middle of Times Square. You were involved in this big flash mob. Uh, what are you trying to tell people about Colombia? What do you want people to know? I think I've always think that music shows uh, what what a country is like and what their people are like, and so I think that. By the music, we can we can really say what is Colombia. Colombia is a happy country. It's a, uh, it has a lot of movement, and and that's what I do with music. And and what we did at Times Square with the flash mob was presenting a little bit of Colombia, uh, giving a surprise to everybody. We we give uh, we we gave out uh, flowers, and flowers are like a very representative thing from Colombia so so it was a beautiful thing and on the also on the on the screens and everything the, there were messages of Colombia pictures of different places and it was like like for 15 minutes Colombia uh, took over the Times Square and and everybody felt that it, it was beautiful you are also involved in the issues of your country uh, you support former guerrillas being reintegrated back into society. Um, we know that the FARC peace talks have been going on. The deadline has been postponed. What do you hope to see when that's all said and done? I think it's, it's going to be um, difficult. It's going to be very difficult because all the reintegration and everything, it's, it's difficult in many ways. Uh, reconciliation, uh, you know, it's like accepting what is going to happen after, but uh, I think we, we, we have to do it now or, or later, but we, we're going to have to do it sometime. So, so we're in the middle of this process. I hope it gets to a good end because uh, it's been difficult. It's like four years they've been in Cuba. And, but, uh, but I think Colombia needs that, you know. It's like we, we deserve it.
we deserve it. After all these years, we, we deserve what is going to happen, and, but it's going to be difficult. You and I were also at an event last year supporting early childhood education in Latin America, especially in some of the poorer regions. Uh, why is this issue important to you? I know that you're a father. Has, has that changed your outlook? Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure, for sure. Well, I think that the, um, if I, and I do it every time I can support it with my music because, uh, you know, like you can uh, grab attention from different people and I think that's, that's a good way to, to use it, you know, like telling people what we're doing and telling people like, for example, these different projects that were in, uh, in these countries, I think it's amazing. So every time they call me to support one of these things, I'm more than happy to do it. What do you hope to do? Are there any issues that you hope to be more involved in? Uh, actually, what we do is we, we choose a couple of projects every year, like to try to help in different things. Like, for example, we just did a, a concert in Colombia and, and a whole activity with a, with a symphonic orchestra for, um, for building some places for, for kids with cancer. And, um, and we've done things in different kinds of, uh, yeah, of, uh, of projects. So I hope to, to keep on helping in different things. I, for me, reintegration in Colombia is one of my main projects, but uh, I work all the time in that. But uh, apart from that, I just choose different projects uh, to help. You know, as we, we've seen, uh, the world is mourning now, the, the loss of Prince. Um, did he have any influence on you yeah, at all? And, sure. and just I want to get your thoughts on, on his passing. I, for me, one of the most important things in music is uh, when you find uniqueness, you know, and Prince had that. Prince was like a, uh, a symbol. <laughs> Just like, just, just like he, he, he used to call himself. Uh, for me, Gold was a tremendous album. That uh, I know every song, and uh, it really, in that time, I, I remember it really influenced. It was a big influence for me in that time, and as an artist, you know, like as, as a concept, because he had everything. No, he was a composer, he was a singer, he was a great guitar player, um, but also. His image and everything was like a, a huge concept, no? Like, kind of like David Bowie thing. So I think it's we we have had a this couple of losses for for the music that are, are huge. But the good side of it is that uh, music never dies. So so we're gonna have his music forever. Where do you see your music going? How do you think that you've evolved and and what are you working toward? Nah. That's difficult to know because I just write the music that I feel that I have to write, you know, it's like uh, I never like think about, okay, I want to go this way or this way, it's just like whatever music uh, I'm listening at the moment or something that, that gives me a lot of um, influence and in a big picture I can tell you that uh, I'm going to keep on exploring with uh, Latin rhythms and, and fusions, you know, and that's what I like to do. Do you want to go eventually go outside of the region? Do you see yourself uh, going to other parts of the world? Do you see yourself doing any projects in English? Yeah, yeah, I want to do it. I want to do it, definitely. I don't know when, but I want to do it. Actually, I, uh, I did a project with a, with a symphonic orchestra in Colombia, and, and two of the songs were in English. There were a couple of covers, so that's the first step. <laughs> Fonseca, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Fonseca took a quick break from his U.S. Canada tour to perform with Spanish singer Miguel Bosé, appearing as a guest artist in the MTV production Unplugged. If you'd like a behind-the-scenes look at our interview with Fonseca, you can find it at cctv-america.com. America's Next.
Finally, we had the privilege of stepping on board the deck of a tall ship from Mexico recently. The vessel and its Mexican marineros were visiting the Washington area as they sail around the world on a mission of friendship. We leave you with these images of the ship, which is named in honor of the last emperor of the Aztec Empire. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again next week for another edition of America's Now. Captains, 31 officers, 81 cadets, and 162 members of the crew. The name of Cuauhtémoc means eagle descending over his prey. Up in Halifax, Canada, and then we're going to cross the Atlantic Ocean. It's going to take us almost 23 days on the sea. We are very proud of, of our ship.